This afternoon we're continuing our series through the Heidelberg Catechism, and uh, in particular, uh, the Lord's Prayer, as the Lord taught us to pray, and we come to the final petition, and uh, that's the one, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And for our Scripture reading, we're going to read uh, Ephesians 6 and verses 10 through 20. So let's give attention now to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired Word. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places." Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is God's Word. It may bless our hearts this afternoon, and would you please turn with me in the Heidelberg Catechism now to Lord's Day uh, 52, Lord's Day 52, which can be found on page uh, 257 in the Forms and Prayers book, as well as uh, page 896 in the Song book, page 257 in the Forms and Prayers book, and page 896 in the Song book. And uh, this uh, Sunday, I want to focus just on uh, question and answer 127, the sixth petition, and then next Sunday, we'll take up the final uh, couple questions there and uh, consider the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so this afternoon, we'll just uh, read responsively question and answer 127, and so let's do that now. What does the sixth petition mean? And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil means we are so weak that we cannot stand on our own for a moment and our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong by the power of Your Holy Spirit so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Amen. Well, in his book on uh, the Lord's Prayer, Albert Moeller um, tells the following story. He says, when I was a child, I loved camping. For 12-year-old boys, camping trips have many thrilling aspects among them that you could spend an entire day outside without being chaperoned by your mom. On one particular trip, I remember playing with friends in an abandoned palmetto field. We ran ourselves into exhaustion, which I now realize was the scoutmaster's plan. After a long day, we finally crawled into our tents and fell asleep. The next morning, we were awakened by three gunshots. Racing out of our tents, we found Colonel Mac Geiger, one of the leading laymen of the church, draping three enormous diamondback rattlesnakes across the front of his Jeep. When we asked where he had shot them, he pointed to the bushes, the very palmetto bushes we had been playing near the night before, blissfully unaware of the danger so near." And uh, this, is a, this illustrates uh, what is true of this world. This world is a dangerous place. And we often don't realize just how dangerous it really is. Um, but it is filled with not only obvious dangers that we can see, but also all kinds of invisible spiritual dangers. 
Uh, The Apostle Paul warns us of this in Ephesians 6 when he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, you know, not just what we see, uh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There's more than meets the eye here. And because of the evil and danger that is all around us, Jesus teaches us to be alert and to pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Uh, This is the sixth and final petition of the Lord's Prayer. As we've seen, the Lord's Prayer is a model prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And it's good and appropriate for us to to pray it, uh, even word for word. Um, but also to uh, learn what we should pray for, to take it up as like a template and uh, to pray our own prayers according to this pattern of prayer. Uh, so far, we, we saw that uh, Jesus teaches us to pray with a childlike reverence and, and trust to our Father in heaven. And then He gave us three petitions uh, that especially connect with His glory. We are to pray Uh, Your kingdom, uh, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First, he emphasizes praying for the glory of God and then then the good of man, right? And he teaches us that we can pray for our physical needs and our spiritual needs. We pray for all of our physical needs, our bodily needs, uh, when he teaches us uh, to give us this day our daily bread. And then for all of our spiritual needs, as we began to see last week, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then today, uh, this prayer. Uh, the three petitions for man could be summarized in that we need to pray for provision, pardon, and protection. And so we'll focus then on this, uh, this final um, prayer for protection. Uh, we pray, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil as our Lord taught us to pray. And uh, three things we'll ask of this, of this petition. First, what does it even mean? What does this prayer mean? And then secondly, why do we need to pray it? And then thirdly, how can we be confident as we pray it? So what does it mean? Why do we need to pray it? And how can we be confident as we pray it? So first, what does it mean? What does, what does it mean to pray this prayer? And we first need to ask, what does temptation mean? Uh, the Greek word for temptation can mean test or temptation. Uh, And these meanings are closely related, but they need to be kept distinct. A a test has more of a positive purpose behind it. God may test His people in order to prove their faith, as He did with Abraham and with Job, for instance. In the Christian life, testing by God is something good and necessary, Uh, It may be a hard test, but James tells us in James 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And so when we take the big picture of sanctification into account and salvation, testing by God is a good thing and something that we should even desire, that He would refine us in the fire, that He would make us more like Jesus Christ that He would make us wiser in His ways. Temptation, on the other hand, has a negative purpose to it. Uh, The purpose of a temptation is to get us to fail by enticing us to sin. And this is why uh, temptation can't come from God. The Bible clearly teaches that God does not tempt anyone. He is not tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone to sin. That's what James 1 says as well. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. So God never tempts someone to sin, trying to entice them to sin. So what then does it mean to ask God not to lead us into temptation? Well, at first glance, it almost seems as if we're praying that God would not tempt us. But as James 1 teaches, God himself cannot tempt us to evil. Yet, this does not mean that our temptations are, you know, just completely outside of His sovereign control. Uh, God may not tempt us, but He does allow temptation to occur. And we see this with Jesus' own temptation in the wilderness. 
uh, shortly before Jesus taught his disciples to pray uh, this prayer in Matthew 6, we read of Jesus' temptation in Matthew 4, where it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So it was within God's sovereign will to allow Jesus to be led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness. But once he got to the wilderness, who is it that tempted Jesus to sin? The devil, of course. The Spirit didn't tempt him, it's the devil. Nevertheless, God allowed it to happen. And the same is true in the Christian life. God may allow us to be tempted with the goal of testing and proving our faith making us more like Christ, but He Himself never tempts us to sin. One Puritan, William Bridge, put it in a profound way. He said, Christ was made like unto us that He might be tempted. We are tempted that we might be made like unto Christ. Think about that. Christ was made like unto us that He might be tempted We are tempted that we might be made like unto Christ. So when we pray, lead us not into temptation, it can mean a couple things. First, we are asking God, on the one hand, to, if it's His will, to keep us from being tempted. And sometimes in God's good and sovereign plan, He keeps us away from temptation. But if it is His sovereign will to allow us to be tempted, Uh, today in some way in order to test us, then we are praying that God will give us the strength to resist the temptation, to stand strong in the faith, and that He'd provide a way of escape that we might flee the temptation. This is why it is added, deliver us from all evil. So this is a prayer ultimately for protection and preservation in the faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God does promise us in His Word in 1 Corinthians 10 that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And isn't that a comforting promise? We can never say, well, nobody's ever been tempted like me in this way. Or there was just no way to avoid sin here? No, God is faithful and He will not allow you or me to be tempted beyond what we are able, but will with that temptation provide a way of escape that we might be able to endure it. And so our catechism puts it this way in, the, uh, in this question and answer 127. And so, Lord, how, uphold us and make us strong by the power of Your Holy Spirit so that we may not be defeated in this spiritual fight, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win this the complete victory. And so this is what we're praying when we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But what is what is why do we need to pray it then? If that's what it means, why do we need to pray this? Well, in the first place, because we are so weak in our own strength. Our catechism humbles us all when it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil means we are so weak. We are so weak that we cannot even stand on our own for a moment. Uh, Recall how weak the apostle Peter was when he denied Jesus three times. He boasted that he would never forsake Jesus He even said, though though all these other disciples might leave you, I'll never do that, Lord. I'll follow you to death. I'll follow you to prison. Whatever it takes, I'll never do that. He had some pride in his heart, presumption. Uh, And yet that very night, he denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. And then he heard that rooster crow and he wept bitterly. He knew the truth that our catechism says that we are so weak that we can't even stand for a moment on our own. But lest we are hard on Peter and soft on ourselves, how many of us have, how many of you have ever sinned and, and said or thought to yourself, I'll never do that again, only to fall again? 
No doubt if a rooster crowed, every time we sinned, we would soon realize how weak we are. Even though we are forgiven in Christ once and for all and have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we still have that old sin nature that wages war on the Holy Spirit within us. And so Galatians 5 says that the desires of the flesh, our sin nature, are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see, in your own strength, you cannot stand against temptation. This is why you need to pray for the Lord's strength. This is a prayer for strength in our weakness. I love how Paul says in Ephesians 1, he prays that we would know the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe. And the way we receive that power is through prayer, which is why Jesus teaches us to pray this prayer. And so we must pray this prayer because we are weak. But besides the fact that we are weak, we need to pray this prayer because our enemies are so strong. Now, who are our enemies? Well, our catechism mentions our three great enemies in the Christian life when it says our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. We've already mentioned our flesh, that sin nature that dwells within us, that wants to rebel against God. Uh, James 1 says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You see, no one can simply say, the devil made me do it. No one can say, the devil controlled me like a puppet and picked me up and carried me against my will into forbidden territory. We tend to play the blame game like that, don't we? And that's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. That's what we saw Israel did in Egypt as well. But each of us are responsible for our own sin and must own up to that. It reminds me of a a story about G.K. Chesterton Uh, In 1901, the Times newspaper asked for people to contribute their ideas to the question, what's wrong with the world? Think about that question. What would you write if you were asked to contribute to this newspaper? What's wrong with the world? Well, this is what he wrote. Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. You see, we can't just blame everyone else out there for our problems. Each of us must confess that we have a sin nature within us. As the Puritan Thomas Brooks put it, there is not a worse nature in hell than that is in you, and it would discover itself accordingly if the Lord did not restrain it. We are weak. We must confess that we have this sin nature. This is our enemy within our sin nature. Now, as an important side note, Jesus did not experience temptation in this way. He never had temptations from within like we do because He never had a sin nature. But the temptations were nevertheless real temptations that came from outside of Him, and He felt the full force of the temptation. Because where we so easily lay down and give into it, he went all the way against it, going against the stream, and never once gave in. But we have this enemy of a sin nature within us, and the temptations within are the most dangerous because they are a part of us. But we also have temptations that come from outside of us, from the devil and the world. Uh, the devil, as we heard this morning, is real. And he has real power. Uh, I think we tend to go to one extreme or the other to either deny the devil's existence and ignore him and think he's not really an enemy or to go to the opposite extreme and be overly obsessed with him. Uh, C.S. Lewis put it this way, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both heirs and hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. 
devil's pleased with either one of those extremes, either uh, denying his existence, ignoring it, thinking it's, he's not really an enemy, or the opposite extreme, just being overly obsessed with him and being an abject terror of him. But you see, the devil is real, and the first thing we must do in this spiritual warfare is acknowledge our enemy. Uh, some scholars believe that Jesus teaches us to pray in this prayer, deliver us from the evil one. Maybe you've been in a church where they pray this prayer and they say, deliver us from the evil one. Uh, that's, that could be translated that way as well. But either way, uh, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil because he's real. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so we must put on, he says, the full armor of God that we might stand against the schemes of the devil. And so first, do you acknowledge that the devil is your enemy? The devil may not be able to snatch us out of our Heavenly Father's hand, but the Bible says that he's still our adversary who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He is out to get us, and he, he tempts us to sin. And then when we have sinned, he's our accuser, right? He, he first makes us think, oh, it's no big deal. Sin is small. God will forgive you. It's okay. Go for it. But then when we sin, then he accuses us. Look what you've done. God will never forgive you. These are the devil's ways. Paul says that we might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He has methods. He has schemes. And elsewhere, Paul says, and we are not ignorant of his schemes. Uh, one of the rules of war is that you study your enemy. And you can study your enemy, the devil, in the Bible. We see in the Bible his ways. He's deceptive. He appears as an angel of light, not as, you know, we see in the cartoons or in movies and all red with the pitchfork and pointy horns. No, he's like an angel of light and he twists the truth. That's one of his devices. He twists the truth. Has God really said, he asks? He gets you to doubt the truth. And he adds to God's truth and he contradicts God's truth. He is a, he's the father of lies, Jesus says. And so we must, in order to do battle against him, take up the sword of the Spirit, the truth of God's Word to expose his lies. In Ephesians uh, 6.11, again, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the devil. And, and all this armor that he highlights, notice, is connected to God's Word. Uh, the belt of righteous, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith. All these things are connected to God's Word, and we must take up God's Word. And what did Jesus do when He did battle against the devil? He took up the sword of the Spirit. He took up God's Word, and He, he battled. He quoted God's Word. And this is how we can fight against Him. But we can study His ways in the Bible and, and see so that we're not deceived by him. Um, other way, things you can think about as you study your enemy, whether it's your, the devil or, or just the situations that you tend to fall into sin, are worth thinking about that you might stand firm in the day of temptation. Uh, one thing that I found helpful is think about the circumstances in which you tend to sin. When does the devil and your sin nature tend to get the upper hand? For example, if you tend to fall into covetousness when you browse uh, Facebook or Instagram or other kinds of social media, either avoid that perhaps or, or be prayerfully on guard when you do that. Spend less time. If you tend to fall into sin when you are idle, right? There's an old saying that idleness is the devil's workshop. When you tend to fall into sin and temptation when you're idle, get busy, get productive, start doing something. If you tend to fall into sin when you are alone, try to be with people more. Often, solitude is when we're tempted to sin, when nobody's looking. If you tend to fall into sinful anger and irritableness when you're tired at the end of a day of work, 
take note of that. And when you come home from work, say a prayer before you go into the living room and it's uh, just chaos everywhere. Uh, study and know your enemies so that you're better able to either avoid temptations or to make a stronger stand against temptation when it comes. And so the devil, along with his demons, is our adversary. But furthermore, we need to pray this prayer because the world assaults us as well. We have not only our sin nature and the devil and the world assaulting us. But what is the world? Uh, the Bible does say that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And uh, so when we hear things like friendship with the world is enmity towards God, it can be kind of confusing. But didn't God love the world? Well, the world can be used in various ways, uh, just in English language, but it is also in the Bible. And the world here means fallen humanity in rebellion against God. And we need to pray this prayer because the world hates us even as the world hated Christ. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If the world hated me, they will hate you. And so the world will at times uh, persecute us, but also the world will tempt us. Temptations abound from the world, and it could come in all different ways. It could come from magazines as you wait in line at the grocery store that might tempt you to lust, or it could come in your mailbox, a catalog that tempts you to covet things that you don't have. And of course, temptations abound all over the internet through Google images and Facebook ads and Instagram photos or Netflix and movies. We don't have to necessarily leave the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. But sometimes we need to get radical in our fight against sin, right? Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And so we need to think about what are the things that greatly tempt us? And where do we need accountability? Where do we need help in those areas? What might we need to avoid? And then we can add all the other things in the world like the temptations, not just of those things, but also uh, non-Christian friends, co-workers, family members, and neighbors that we encounter in life. Our uh, non-Christian neighbors and friends can tempt us to lust. Some tempt us to sinful anger and bitterness. Some tempt us to fear and anxiety. Others to gossip. And so we need to be on guard against that as well. It's okay to have Christ non-Christian friends, and we want to be a light in their life and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, but it's so important that we also have solid Christian friends and a church family that can encourage us in the Christian life and help us and pray for us. And so we need to pray the, the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer because we are weak and we have three great enemies, the world and the flesh and the devil, who are our sworn enemies and are far stronger than us in our own strength. As our catechism adds, they never stop attacking us. There's never a day. You ever think about it? There's never a day that they, ne that they stop attacking us where they just say, oh, it's okay. I'll let you have a freebie day off here. No. But how often is that kind of our tendency to, to drift into spiritual laziness and to not be alert, to not be watchful and in prayer, to sort of be like Peter, presumptuous, right? But we have to remember that we need to be daily fighting against sin daily fighting against our three sworn enemies and uh, delivering them new blows each and every day by God's Word and Spirit. And so that's why we need to, to pray this prayer because we are so weak and our enemies are so strong. One of the paradoxes of the Christian life, I think, is the fact that the stronger we get in the Christian life, the more we realize how weak we are and how much we need to depend on the Spirit's strength and pray this prayer. But how then can we be confident as we pray this prayer? You know, up to this point, it might be a little bit of a downer, the things that have been said, but I want to leave you with a note of confidence. We can be confident as we pray this prayer as well. And why is that? Well, because Christ has already won the final victory for us. And so Paul says in Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You see, the assumption there is that we are able in Christ to stand firm against the devil's schemes. 
And the only way to do that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, trusting in Him, resting in His completed victory for us in His life, death, and resurrection. Because Jesus is our second Adam who stood firm against the devil's schemes when He was tempted in the wilderness. He did battle against the devil with the Word of God and resisted the devil, and the devil fled from Him. Then the devil attacked Jesus in various ways throughout His ministry. Jesus said the Pharisees were always attacking Jesus and that they were of their father, the devil. When Peter tried to prevent Jesus from going to the cross, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Then the devil took another shot at Jesus when he entered Judas the betrayer, which then led to his arrest and his scourging and crucifixion and his burial. See, the devil all throughout Jesus' life was attacking Jesus, but Jesus conquered the devil for us through his Death on the cross. It seemed that the devil had won, but it's a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, right? Where it says that the seed of the woman would come forth and the serpent would bruise his heel, but then he would crush the serpent's head. And that took place for us on the cross. It's like it was a surprising victory. It's like when David defeated Goliath, right? You don't expect it. And then it happens. And you know what happened when David defeated Goliath, what he did after that? He cut off Goliath's head. That's the part you don't hear in Sunday school classes as a kid. But that's what it says. And it was pointing forward to the great defeat of the devil on the cross when Jesus would crush the serpent's head for us. And so we have the victory in Christ. As we saw this morning, God will swallow up all of our enemies in Christ. And so as you do battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, take heart because Jesus has won the battle already for us. He says in uh, John 16, in the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. 1 John 3 says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. As Luther said in his hymn, a mighty fortress is our God, one little word shall fell him. And Jesus conquered the guilt and power of sin for you. And God's Word says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so don't, don't give up. The final judgment's already behind us on the cross. And we have the spirit strength so that sin is not our ultimate master. Romans 6 says, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. And so you see, we can pray this prayer with confidence knowing that we are forever in the grip of God's relentless grace. Jesus says, no one can snatch my sheep out of my hand or my Father's hand. The Word promises us that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And so we press on praying this prayer. And notice again that we pray this prayer together. I've highlighted this throughout the Lord's Prayer, that Jesus teaches us often to pray for we and us. And here it's the same. He says, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from all evil. You see, we're in this battle together. You are not alone in the Christian life. You have your brothers and sisters. Look around. These are your comrades as you pray this prayer. And so let us press on together in confidence in Christ, knowing that He has won the final battle for us in His life, death, and resurrection, and that He is coming again. Let us depend on the Spirit's strength each and every day and take up the sword of the Spirit and stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's uh, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word to us once again and how comforting and assuring it is and even convicting. And, uh, but we thank You that uh, You love us and that You've shown Your love to us in Jesus Christ, that while we were yet sinners, He died for us. And even more, not only have You forgiven us and You've declared us righteous in Him and clothed us in His righteousness and adopted us as Your own beloved children. So what do we have to fear? Help us not to fear. Help us to know that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us and that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so may we, as your beloved children, uh, do battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, 
uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, standing firm in the Lord Jesus Christ, taking up the whole armor of God. And so help us, dear Father, preserve us in the faith by the power of your Holy Spirit until we see our Savior face to face and are perfectly like him and reign with him over all things. We pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.